everyone. Thank you, Al Mead, for joining us. Now, if you all don't know Al Mead, this is the first gold medal Paralympian. Paralympian. Okay. Help me. Help me, Dean. <laughs> help, help me, Dean. Help me with that. To ever be inducted into Georgia's Hall of Fame. And we are really so glad to have you here and talk about overcoming the odds with us. It's a pleasure. So, uh, we want to get right on into it. Um, I want to start off well with this quote. It says, impossible odds set the stage for amazing miracles. Okay. And when we look at your career and what you've been able to do as an athlete in track and field, you've been able to really let people see miracles happen on the track and field, field yeah. that they've never seen before. Al, can you start off by... First, telling us before we talk about your amazing career, how did what? How did it come that you lost your your yeah, leg? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> well, born and raised in Chicago, uh, South Side, and uh, April 9th, nineteen sixty eight. The whole world was focused right here in Atlanta, and it was because it was the day that um, they were burying the Dr. Martin Luther King. It was his funeral service. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in honor of Dr. King, on that day, they let out school in the Chicago public school system. Uh, I was a, a kid, nine years old, third grade, uh, an athlete, aspiring athlete. My cousin and I went and shot some hoop um, at, uh, at school grounds because they let out school. So we said, hey, let's just take advantage and practice our game. Mm -hmm. And uh, went up for a rebound and uh, came down very awkward, hit the pavement, and then as a result of that impact, um, it created a, an infection, a blood clot, possible um, a, a fracture that wasn't uh, seen at the time. Uh, went to the hospital, they sent me home thinking it was a bruise. Uh, only a few days later uh, indicated that there was an infection that set in. And I was in a race to, to save my life. Uh, my mom had to share the, the terrible news that um, in order for them to save my life, they're gonna have to amputate my leg. And so I went through three major operations in the span of uh, about five weeks wow. in Hyde Park Osteopathic Hospital and uh, at the ankle below the knee and then finally above the knee to, to um, to save my life. It, it, it's uh, ironic that it happened on Dr. King's funeral where uh, he had a dream and you talked mm -hmm. about dreams and it seemed like my dreams had crashed but uh, but because of my faith and I grew up uh, in a uh, Christian home uh, I told my mom don't worry uh, God's gonna grow my leg back <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's how confident uh, that I was uh, and uh, of course she was concerned that uh, this little kid had dreams that his leg was gonna grow back. But I tell people all the time, it did grow back. It Amen. didn't grow back physically, yes. but God gave me everything that I needed to get back in action, to get back on my feet, to, uh, to do the things he called me to do. So Pastor Al, as a fellow Chicago, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know what it was like and did it prevent you from playing sports after the amputation? No, it didn't. I, I was really blessed. Uh, I mean, literally four or five months prior to that accident, we had just moved into a community uh, across the street from Foster Park. Ah, and oh. uh, and uh, when, when I lived on uh, 59th Street, uh, people told my parents, you need to get your son plugged into sports. That sort of thing. They bought this house across the street from this beautiful park. Lots of activity. As you know, Foster Park, baseball diamonds, yes. football mm -hmm. fields, yeah. even an auditorium. I mean, it was great. And, um, and so I was ready. And uh, then this happened. Uh, I remember sitting on a corner on a fire hydrant um, uh, after my amputation, looking at all the activities across the street. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm an amputee, a crutch up across my shoulder, sitting on a fire hydrant, uh, no longer this athlete. And uh, this lady drove by, and, I, and I'll call her an angel, because uh, 83rd Street, right across the street from the park, she know, stopped exactly. her car. And she said, son, I seen you run all over the place. Uh, don't feel sorry for yourself. 
Wow. You know, mm-hmm. and I wanted to say, what am I supposed to do? There's no hopping contest. Against <laughs> <you know? laughs> and, uh, but I, I understood her encouragement. Mm-hmm. And from that point, I went to my garage and got my bicycle, uh, learned how to ride my bike with one leg, uh, wow. pulling up the pedal, pushing down the pedal. That was the beginning of my determination that this lady said, uh, basically it's a quote that that I love, there's no, uh, what it does you no good to sit up and just take notice if you just keep on sitting. Mm. And mm. so I got up and, uh, and, and got back in action. And, and from that day on, uh, when I got my first prosthetic leg, I was already, it was already set in motion that I wasn't gonna sit down, even though I didn't know of anyone in Chicago that was another amputee, Mm -hmm. at least in my neighborhood. I was the only amputee. I was the only person deemed uh, with a disability, but it was a school of hard knocks. I was able to play. Um, They allowed me to play in spite of uh, having a prosthetic leg. And that's a whole story too, because uh, legs weren't designed back then for sports. Mm -hmm. They were just designed for walking. But this kid said that uh, I'm going to play. <laughs> and as a result, I broke my leg tons of times. And my prosthetist, who uh, one of the only, at the time, African-American prosthetists on the south side of Chicago, wow. actually in the country, wow. uh, Northwestern grad, uh, Northwestern and UCLA were the only prosthetic, orthotic type uh, uh, gamers of prosthetics yeah. mm-hmm. and he was mm-hmm. one of them and he said I caught your vision I'm going to make them stronger I'm going to make them faster I'm going to make sure that you're back in the game so I had this guy helping me really get back into the game oh, so, wow. so Pastor me, tell me this when and how did you decide that you wanted to compete in track and field in the Paralympics that didn't come until really af- after college oh. because uh, Paralympics was not a known entity until really the 88 games of Seoul, Korea was when it really exploded. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, Special Olympics was, was, is really the brand for sports with disabilities, mm-hmm. but with Special Olympics, it's, it's more of a, a, a mental uh, disability in a lot of ways. Uh, and... Um, in Paralympics, it's physical, such as an artificial limb or uh, eyesight or uh, paraplegic. Okay. And so that's 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 that distinguishes the Paralympian from the Olymp- yes. from the Special Olympians, and uh, and so uh, it really didn't take off to '88. So prior to that, I just competed in regular sports. Mm-hmm. I tried out for my high school basketball team okay. at Kenwood High School in Hyde Park to. Uh, teams at Foster Park, and so you were. I, I played yeah. with the with the able-bodied people, and so that's where I gained my competitive edge. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then when I found out about the Paralympics that I could compete against uh, people similar to me with a physical disability, amputees, I'm like, okay. Uh, bring those amputees on. I'll, mm-hmm. uh, I'll run them out the, uh, the place. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, my first competition, uh, track and field event, I ran the 100 meter. And at that event, I broke the world record for an above knee amputee. Wow. And I couldn't believe that, uh, that I found my space at that mm-hmm. moment. Um, and so I did the high jump and realized that I wasn't the best in the world, that there were others in the world that could jump higher, jump longer. So that's when I really gravitated to the fact that there was a high level of competition all mm-hmm. around the world, even though I was one of the best in the USA. And so it wasn't until the 88 games where uh, the Paralympics was combined with the Olympics, uh, and at that point was when uh, I really excelled into the uh, the disabled sports arena. Because you Olympics. really traveled the world, being in Barcelona, yes, Seoul. Barcelona, Seoul. I competed in Germany. I competed in Israel. I competed in Canada. I mean, so so I have friends all over that I competed against. Uh, being exposed internationally was really great for me. 
and uh, and other amputees and other techniques to friendships that that are lifelong that you'll never never forget. So as in Morehouse, you mentioned Morehouse as yeah. a Morehouse graduate as well as a world record holder in track and field. Sure, you met many interesting people. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of your? People? Yeah. Well, of course, when you go to Morehouse, you you're required to go to chapel and and you hear a lot of speakers you get close to. Of course, uh, when I was there was when uh, Martin Luther King III was there, Spike Lee okay. was there, those guys, and um, and so uh, of course they were young like I was, but of course in my uh, Paralympic days, and and I was blessed to also be on the organizing committee okay. of the '96 Games, was the vice chair of the Paralympic side, and so I served under President Clinton's. Uh, uh, sports, uh, physical fitness and sports council. I was on the United States Olympic Committee. Wow. Uh, I am serving on the uh, the '96 Games. I mean, from Andy Young to to the best of the best around the world. You know, you're able to to connect with. And so uh, my greatest moment of meeting was Muhammad Ali. Wow! I met Muhammad Ali personally in the Oval Office at the White House. And, uh, that was and, interesting. And, yeah. uh, and my family called me one day. Uh, my uncle said, man, I saw you in the middle of Jet Magazine <laughs> yeah. in the Oval Office with Muhammad Ali. <laughs> well, let me tell you, especially from <laughs> Chicago, when you make it in the Jet uh, Avenue, uh, you, you hit big time, yeah, so, okay? Uh, and especially if you hit the White <laughs> House. Exactly. The, the Oval Office. So the Oval Office, me and Muhammad Ali and a few wow. others with President Clinton was, was one of the great, greatest experiences. And I remember in our waiting room, uh, when we were waiting to go meet the president, as I was walking closer to Muhammad uh, to shake his hand and say, man, champ, it was a pleasure to meet you. So as I was getting closer, he was doing the air boxing, you know, oh, wow. gave me a big hug. And, and that was that was pretty cool. There. Yeah. Well, I mean, with, again, when you talk about <clears throat> overcoming the odds, who knew that? a child on the south side of Chicago. Yeah. It seems like all hope is totally gone. Yeah. Okay, I, I just came down wrong. All of, yeah. I'm just playing basketball and I just came down wrong and who knew that that would end yeah. up, um, you end up being an amputee from that. As you went throughout your career, throughout your life and college life, how did you feel about uh, the term disability? I know yeah. we live in a political correct world yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. so, did you ever see yourself as disabled? Yeah. How how would you great, describe? Great, great question. Yeah, of but, course. Uh, growing up the South Side of Chicago, with a person with a disability, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, they don't give you any slack. So I had plenty of nicknames, you know, yeah. Kryptonite, Pimpin' Out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so they just be, <laughs> no one uh, <laughs> They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't take yeah, any, they didn't feel sorry for you. No pity, no pity. So no pity for me, no yeah, pity. It was a school no. of hard knocks. Yeah. And so I grew up under that pressure. Mm. Uh, however, it was my faith that really sustained me. Uh, uh, when, when I gave God my disability, he took the dis off disability. When I gave oh, him my availability, and he gave me a super ability, I tell people to do everything he called me to do. Wow. And so, so God sustained me, you know, when I, my mom told me, I said, God was going to grow mm -hmm. my leg back. You know, um, I tell people things happen to you, things happen around you, but the thing that matters most is what happens inside of you. Yes. And, and it was my faith. It was the attitude that, uh, that, uh, set up a uh, setback is set up for a comeback That's right. and that I, I was going to bounce back. And so. So that's where uh, my determination came from, was mm -hmm. from my faith, as well as now, too, fighting for those who also experience similar uh, dispositions as I. Uh, there was a kid who I met back in 96 games who had just uh, became an amputee 10 years old. And I was able to go to him and say, hey, bud, don't worry. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let me encourage you, you and your mom. And as a result, 
uh, this kid went on to play athletics in school wow. and that sort of deal. And then, of course, being a part of the United States Olympic Committee, President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sports, I was an advocate for those with disabilities yes. to open up doors uh, mm -hmm. that perhaps wasn't afforded them. And as a result, uh, it, it, it blessed me to mm -hmm. be a blessing to others and to give back. And it's interesting because a lot of times people don't realize part of overcoming the odds puts you in a position to be of service and to be um, and activism Absolutely. for someone else Absolutely. and so that's what I hear you saying yeah. and I want to go back to what you were talking about when you were speaking about your faith yeah. and I know that you uh, traveled to Barcelona can you tell us a story about um, how you how you sang but you changed the words to yeah hear well it. Okay. yeah no it's uh, <laughs> it's you know we were awarded the games in Atlanta mm -hmm. and um, and of course um uh, whenever the host city uh, hosts the Olympics, you you want to uh, um, display your culture, present your culture. Of course, uh, in the South, especially being here in Atlanta, um, our culture was spiritual. Mm -hmm. It was civil rights mm -hmm. uh, as well. And uh, our torch that we lit that I actually ran up the steps through our opening ceremonies okay. of the Paralympic side wow. uh, was lit by the everlasting uh, flame of Martin Luther King. Wow. wow. And so, uh, so our theme line was triumph of the human spirit. Uh, our flame came from the tomb of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to present the torch uh, start the torch run at the White House where I introduced the President of the United States at that particular time wow. and uh, which was really neat and then running up the stadium steps but also uh, Triumph of the Human Spirit was the theme uh, because of my uh, faith I was allowed to choose the song and I chose a Larnell song called Mighty Spirit okay. because it wasn't the human spirit mm. of course you know, you could achieve it if you believe it and that sort of thing. Mm. But I know that deep down inside, it was uh, it was God's spirit. It was uh, Holy Spirit. It was it was my faith. And so mighty spirit is what I sung, which was received very well. And then as a result, we had a 5000 voice gospel choir at the opening ceremonies mm -hmm. for the Paralympics. Uh, as I was running up the stadium steps with the torch, and it was Kirk Franklin was uh, leading the choir. Wow! As well. Yeah, so wow. we recruited churches all over the city to participate, yes. wow. and so uh, so that was pretty cool. That, that was a, a great moment. Now, Pastor Al, you speak of your faith as a PK, and I don't know if people know about that, but your father was a pastor. Is that correct? Well, actually, he he wasn't officially a pastor, but he, but had, he did he pastor duties. Yeah, mm -hmm. he he was the lead of the church uh, during interim times, and and that's where I really got my my faith. But tell me this: yeah. how was your faith allowed you to influence others you meet, not only spiritually, yeah, but politically? Yeah. Politically as well, um, you know, when it comes to faith, uh, as, especially the church where I'm at now, I, I believe that uh, the cross of Jesus Christ levels the planting field. Mm. That when the Bible says whosoever, that mm. really means whosoever. And, um, and I've always been a firm believer that, uh, that uh, we're to love all Jesus Christ loved, all Jesus saved all. And, uh, and so my faith comes out from a political perspective where, you know, it's not about whether you're right, left, center. It's really about what's right and, mm -hmm. and the cross and Jesus Christ and Amen. loving one another. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says, you know that you are, people will know you are my disciples by your love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, uh, from a political perspective, I don't put a lot of faith in politics. Uh, I put more of my faith in, in Jesus Christ. And as a result, uh, being under one roof, the experience that we have um, at, at New Hope, at least, is one where uh, leave your politics at the door, mm -hmm. uh, bring your Bible, 
come hear the word, uh, live out the word, express the word, share the word, let's be unified by the word and the political ideology, all the noise that you hear outside that we're going to keep outside. And um, it ain't about uh, who you represent. Um, politically, it's, it's uh, who you are in Jesus Christ. But I know you would have to be adamant that people vote, that it's important. Yes. Oh, absolutely. No, no. I, uh, I honor those who serve, uh, who are public servants, and, and support them big time. Um, and no doubt, you have to vote. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't vote. Uh, I mean, yes. our, our civil rights uh, uh, predecessors yes. uh, died yes. for that. Yes. Um, Martin Luther King uh, was huge in, uh, in civil rights. So I, I strongly, yes, I strongly <laughs> believe in civil rights. Uh, but we also have to make sure that uh, that you do the right thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. That. Uh, that um, that that you don't let the politics keep you from doing the right thing, and the only way to do that is to vote, and is to get the right people in office yes, who sir. share the same heart. Yes. So, Pastor Mead, gold medalist, Georgia Hall of Famer. I mean, what's what's next? What's next for you? Wow, that that is a good question. Um, if you had asked me 20 years ago before I went into ministry, I would have said, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years later, now that I've been in ministry, 10, 20 years full-time minister, I will say to this day, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I, I just allow God to open up the doors. Um, and, um, you know, um, being a pastor where I am, mm -hmm. I am involved in community. I am involved in every aspect from not just from the spiritual side, but also with chamber of commerce to mm -hmm. community elements That's to activism. the schools, mm -hmm. board of education. So I'm a community person. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I also reiterate, yes, you, you, you definitely have to vote and, um, and take stands where, where you need to take stands um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. People said you should run for office, uh, you I should do this, uh, or you should, Get you know, bubble. yeah, I, <laughs> I, I have no idea, but I just want to be where God wants me to be. And right now I'm allowed to do a lot of those things that I enjoy doing in the community. Um, and, and if you want to call it activism, it, it's really being engaged and involved so that, um, uh, you can be a voice. Uh, you mm -hmm. could be a conduit, yes. Yes. Uh, and you could use the gifts that God's blessed you with to be a blessing to others, and that that's my philosophy. Pastor Al, if, if I, in conclusion, pretty much, if I had to ask you, uh, what do you feel has been one of your greatest accomplishments, and mm. why? Good question. Greatest accomplishments, wow. I know there have been many, yeah. but I'd like you to focus on one and explain why. Um, I think I know where you're going to go. <laughs> really? I wish I knew. Um, you know, I, I am really glad that God has blessed me to be a blessing to the next generation mm -hmm. with my kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I think one of the greatest achievements that you could have is in spite of all the stuff accolades. and yeah. accolades yeah. that you've been blessed with, does it stop there wow. or do you hand over the baton? Mm. Okay. And so you think of a track and field analogy, um, you know, you want to pass the baton that's, that's deep right and you want to pass it to the person, the next generation better off than where you were. Mm. You know, when you think about a four by four uh, relay, uh, when the first leg passes off to the second, they're further along. When the second passes to the third, they're further along. Mm -hmm, yes. When the third passes to the anchor, you know, they're headed to the finish line. And so I'd like to think that one of my greatest achievements is who am I passing the baton off wow. to for that next generation? Who am I investing in? And, uh, and if I could do that and take our next generation to the next level, 
then I would think that's the greatest accomplishment. Tell us a little about your family, though. So that's, what I was about getting, that's what I was getting ready to talk about. about time. Exactly. Yeah. We, we're in sync right here. That's, what, that's where I was that's going on. Your, yes. <laughs> your, your greatest accomplishment in terms of your family and passing it yeah. on in generations. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, my wife, beautiful wife, Shelly, um, married 34 years oh, right now. this month. Right. So yes. she's my sweetheart. And, um, and so we have two beautiful daughters, and um, Ashley is uh, who um, actually both are athletes. Uh, mm-hmm. They both played college volleyball scholarship, mm-hmm. but always shared with them. You know, um, sports is just a vehicle to get get you where you you could go mm-hmm. and, and where God's called you to yes. be. And so Ashley is, uh, she has blessed us, her family, with two grandkids. Yeah. Uh, she is also um, an anesthesiologist. Wow. Uh, that when she went to Middle Tennessee State University, then Morehouse Medical School, and now she's finishing up a fellowship of residency in anesthesiology. All right. And then Monique, who is still here in Atlanta, uh, Georgia Tech uh, grad, who is now an attorney. And uh, and if there's a person who's an advocate, there's no doubt that one <laughs> yeah. would, would be that person. So, so yeah, I, f- I feel blessed to be able to pass a legacy to your children. But also, you know, um, God's children are my children. God's mm-hmm. children are my children. Mm-hmm. And so wherever I can impact and influence, I speak to kids all the time. I speak at schools all the time. <laughs> and the whole purpose is to really give them some encouragement to to reach their goals and what God's called them to do. I, I just want to touch on the fact, too, that if I'm not mistaken, your daughter, Monique, also followed in your footsteps in this regard in terms of being able to uh, be a professional athlete overseas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. even, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. did pass the yeah. time, and even yeah. though you might not have any juniors, yeah. I mean, your your yeah. daughters are definitely yeah. carrying on the legacy, yeah. and then you got yeah, Monique went the, on to uh, be Georgia Tech's all time volleyball player, wow. points leader, yes. and uh, four time All American, and then she went on to play professionally overseas and so represented she, the USA. So she got as well. Those genes from you, that's well, yeah. yeah, well, they. Uh, they got their genes from me, but they're smart. So from their mama, oh, so. smart yeah. man. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow, Al, it has been a pleasure yeah. having you well, it's speak been a out. Being here. And, um, you know, before before we let you go, I mean, I'd just like to open up to our guests. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on that you want to touch on about your career, your family, your faith, about activism, or overcoming the odds, period, that yeah. we didn't get a chance to touch on? Yeah, no, I think we touched on a, a lot of it. I mean, the, the theme is um, don't give up. Um, uh, everyone must accept the cards dealt to him or her, but she or, or he alone decides how they're going to play it to Absolutely. Right. That's right. And so we can't control necessarily what happens uh, to us, but we can control uh, how we use the cards that's given us. And, uh, and so uh, I just want to be an encouragement that, um, that uh, I, I've got a poster here that, that I do love. And, um, and, and this is a poster of me jumping in Barcelona. Uh, it says, Alamine oh, wow. lost one leg at age nine. Now he breaks world records with the other. And at the bottom it says, what's your excuse? Wow. No and, so, and this is a challenge to, no matter what the setback, no matter the challenge, that uh, let's not use the excuse not to press on and move forward to, to, to do God, what God's called you to do. So excuses are tools of incompetence. Because it's monuments of nothing. <laughs> and those who specialize in it are seldom good for anything else. So we really appreciate the wisdom that you've blessed us with this morning. Well, it was a blessing. This Thank you. And we just want to remind the audience, hey, you can overcome the odds and you have a voice. So make sure that you speak out. Speak out. This is Julie L signing off. This is Dino L signing off. Hey.